Good morning once again, folks. Uh, if you would, I'll have you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. It continually stuns me how much is contained in this chapter. Uh, so we keep taking off little bite-sized pieces here, and uh, uh, we did so once again in the last message. In the last message, we talked about the fate of those who worship the beast or the Antichrist. And of course, this led to a discussion uh, about hell and eternal torment. Um, kind of a heavy subject, I know. Um, but once again, I just want to remind us all that though God is loving, he is also just. And uh, quite frankly, he's not messing around. Um, it's, sin is a very, very serious thing. And if we want to understand how serious sin really is, we need look no further than the cross. Uh, there we have all of God's attributes on display uh, in Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to move on. I had mentioned in the last message that this section forms a little bit of a uh, contrast, if you will, between the believing and the unbelieving. And originally I had seen this as one message done all at one time, and then as happened so often, I got looking at it and realized I had to bite it, uh, take it in smaller bites and divide it in two. So this is basically the second half of that message. Um, in a section here that I've titled uh, The Perseverance of the Saints. Uh, I'm going to read a fairly small section, and, and yes, it's a section that we've read many times as we, we keep coming back to this one section here. So in Revelation 14, I'm going to read verses 9 through 13. 9 through 13. And the Word of God says, Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, in whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God in their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. And with that, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, in your grace, we do pray that your, your Holy Spirit will be with us this day, the very Spirit that inspired the writing of these words. Uh, Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to hear and to understand these words. Uh, Father, it's hard, I think, to, to put into words and to convey to people uh, how truly important it is that we really believe what we have here before us. And Father, I do ask you um, to so work in our hearts that we will believe what we have here before us and we will change our entire lives to reflect that belief. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so as I like to say, this is big picture stuff here. This is big uh, eternal consequence uh, type material. Uh, so here in verse 12, the focus shifts from those who worship the beast, a.k.a. the Antichrist, uh, and then the focus is turned to the saints. Now, as usual, whenever I see this word saints in a text that I'm preaching on, I like to slow things down just a little bit and make sure that we understand what that word actually means, okay? And especially considering that we have... Uh, several new people that have joined us over a period of time, and we never know who's uh, watching on Facebook. 
because of the way this word gets used in popular culture, I like to make sure that we have an accurate understanding of it. Uh, in popular culture, uh, the word saint gets used as everything from a comment on somebody who is exceptionally morally pure uh, to a member of a football team from New Orleans. Um, so it has a variety of different meanings. But I like to make it plain here that in Scripture, when we see that word saint, it is simply referring to a believer, okay? And we had Old Testament saints, there were Old Testament believers, and there are New Testament believers. Uh, the Old Testament believers, as we talked about uh, last time, they simply looked forward to Christ. In other words, they didn't have all the revelation that we have, but they trusted God, and they were saved through faith in believing that God would provide for their salvation. And in our time, as New Testament believers, uh, we have the full revelation of Jesus Christ, and we look back to the cross, and we are saved by believing in Jesus. And by doing that, we attain the title of saint, okay? And I like to clarify that because also the Catholic Church uh, uses the term saint as a title that they bestow upon believers who have done things that are especially meritorious, uh, uh, it's kind of a super class of believer, if you will, where people have done something exceptional or exemplary in their life, and then they are bestowed the title of saint. But here in the Bible, where we see this word, it is simply referring to someone who is a believer. <clears throat> uh, the word itself actually is a reference to holy ones. And of course, we can only uh, have that title because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And by imputed, I mean that the righteousness, the perfect righteousness of Christ, when we come to faith in him, is placed on our account. And then, so therefore, in God's eyes, we become truly holy. Um, so that's why we are referred to as saints or holy ones. <clears throat> and of course, we also become increasingly holy in reality as the Holy Spirit continues to sanctify us and we go through a process by which we are more and more conformed to the image of Christ. And yes, sometimes that process seems painfully slow to us, uh, but Scripture tells us that all those that believe in Jesus are in a growth process where we are more and more being conformed uh, into his image. And over time, we look more and more uh, like our adopted big brother. We are also told in verse 12, here is the perseverance of the saints. So we have been uh, moving through this chapter quite slowly, as I said, going piece by piece. And so this may seem like a rather abrupt change of focus here as all of a sudden the focus gets switched to the believer. Um, but I think a lot of this is kind of highlighted by the fact that we have been moving so slowly um, that we kind of forget about what came in the previous chapter. So in the previous chapter, if we take chapter 13 and chapter 14 together, if we were reading through both of them continuously, we would have a better picture of how this all fits together. Um, so to review... Uh, if we go back to chapter 13, we are introduced to the beast, okay? He sees this beast um, coming up out of the sea, and this beast, as we discussed, is the Antichrist. And so this beast grows up, comes to power, starts to demand everyone's worship, and it says all who were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, they go running after this Antichrist, they worship him, and we also see people taking his mark, okay? And we discussed back in chapter 13 that without taking this mark of the beast, um, people were not allowed to buy or sell or do anything. And also, in conjunction with that, there was a false prophet who was pointing to the Antichrist, uh, demanding that people worship him, and there were false signs and wonders, and... Uh, he also had the authority to cause all those who refused to worship the beast to be killed, okay? So here we see it, like this is a high-stakes 
thing that's going on here. And as I said, when we went through that previous chapter, uh, there are various views on this. Some people see this simply as symbols being used to paint a picture for everyday Christian life, which I think is absolutely true. And there's also uh, a view which says that this is a forward-looking, futuristic prophecy of a time that is to come. And clearly, Scripture talks about many antichrists and the spirit of antichrist, which is present in the world. But it also speaks about the antichrist. And I think that's why we should understand this to mean specifically that a specific time in the future is being referred to here. However, like I said, the principles that we take away from this are universally applicable in all times. What we're going to talk about here is a, uh, an uplifting uh, message of encouragement for all of, for all of us in all times, regardless of when we happen to live and when we happen to be studying uh, the scriptures. And I have to tell you, uh, McKenna, I thought about you the entire time I was making this message. You want to know why? Because when we look at this section that we're talking about today, um, this is God uh, cheerleading for us. Uh, he really is. He's psyching us up and he is preparing us for what is to come. And he does so through using images in his word. So I thought about our resident cheerleader here when I was studying for this message. Um, because that's really what I want us to take home from here. When we look at the comparison between the believer and the unbeliever, and we look at what is in store for both groups, uh, this is here to encourage us and give us strength. No matter what challenges we may face in life, whether we uh, exist in the time of the Antichrist or we're just trying to get through our Christian walk in our current time, this is all universally applicable. So that's what I want us to keep in mind. And although I do think that it's important for us to realize what the scripture has for us and look ahead to that future time, uh, please, you know, realize that we need to start applying all of this to our current life in the here and now. We're all going to have challenges. We're all going to be faced with the temptation to compromise and to cut corners on our faith, if you will, or to give up our faith altogether. And uh, this is our call to stand firm in our faith and to cling to the Lord Jesus Christ with everything that we have. <clears throat> so those who worship the Antichrist, as we saw in the last message, uh, they may appear to have an easier time in the here and now, right? Uh, earthly speaking, um, they're not being persecuted. They don't have to worry about uh, how am I going to buy and sell and provide for my family, uh, they may not be facing starvation because they have no way to provide for their family. Um, in the here and now, they may look like they're on the right path. And for a time, yes, they're going to have it more easy. But as we read in the text here, eternity is going to be much different for them. As we discussed in the last message, they will be tormented day and night. And the text says they will have no rest. For eternity, there will be no rest for them. And, you know, I thought about this old saying that I've heard for years, there's no rest for the wicked. And I almost wonder if this isn't exactly where that phrase comes from, is right here in this text. Um, but the situation with believers uh, is placed right here in juxtaposition with the unbelievers, okay? So we have a, a major contrast taking place. This is what it looks like for them on earth, but this is what it looks like for them when we talk about eternity. Uh, two very different destinies, and it's very, very important that we keep these things in mind. <clears throat> sure, the believer is going to have it tougher in the here and now, and there will be many, many uh, situations where we will suffer or we will be persecuted for our faith. Uh, but we have to keep the bigger picture in mind, and that is what happens when we leave here and we face eternity. And uh, I also thought of uh, Rick and Retta, because as they would say, we are glory bound, okay? We might suffer and appear to lose here in the earthly setting, but we are glory bound, 
and we will live forever in heaven with Christ once we leave here if we simply cling to our faith. And as I said, so this is where God is really pumping us up. He's not only asking us to count the cost ahead of time. Uh, this is what the Christian life is going to require. But then he is encouraging us to walk the walk, uh, as they say. And so that is what we find here in this section. And honestly, uh, this is really, really good stuff. <clears throat> um, so in the cheering section here, it starts with this statement in verse 12. <clears throat> here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And so there actually is a doctrine that gets titled after this very statement, the perseverance of the saints. It's also sometimes called the doctrine of eternal security. And this doctrine teaches, and it's very, very scriptural, as I hope to demonstrate in a minute here, states that any true believer in Jesus Christ will never ultimately fully and finally fall away, but they will maintain their faith in Christ to the end, no matter what happens. And yes, if you think back a ways, I have taught about this several times. Uh, uh, one time in the not so recent uh, past, I think. Um, but I'm here to tell you, this is laying right square in front of me and it feels like a ball on a tee and somebody's just asking you to hit it out of the park. So that's what I'm going to do. Because I'm going to teach on this doctrine each and every chance uh, I get a reason to. Uh, the doctrine of eternal security is a wonderful uh, and musical phrase to me and one that I find particularly comforting. Um, at the end of the day, I need to know that I am being held by the power of God. Why? Because just like everything else, uh, as one of my co-workers used to say years ago, I could mess up a free hot lunch, right? Uh, let alone something as important as my eternal security uh, it better not be left to me because I'm going to falter and I'm going to mess it up. Well, we can rest easy in the fact that Scripture makes it plain. That is not the case. We are being held by the power of God. And this phrase tells us what it means to persevere. It means to keep the commandments of God and to keep our faith in Jesus. Uh, to last until the end, no matter what challenges we may face uh, in this life. Uh, Jesus himself, speaking of the tribulation period, said, The one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. Uh, and that's what it means to finish well, is to keep the faith and come what may, arrive at the end, still believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> now, as I said, it is the testimony of sacred, sacred scripture that those who genuinely have placed their faith in, in Christ uh, we'll never uh, lose that faith. If we look back just a little ways in Revelation 13, 8, uh, for example, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Right? So, we already have a dichotomy here between those two groups. The ones that don't falter, that don't turn and worship the beast are the same who their names have been written in the roll call in heaven from before all creation. Um, also looking at John 6, 37 and following, it says, and these are the words of the Lord himself here, everything that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I certainly will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of everything that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus makes this explicit, right? Uh, we come to Jesus because God has given us to him, and he says, of all that the Father gives me, I lose 
None. We are secure in Christ. Uh, Romans 8.28, here we are, back to my favorite chapter again. It's hard to even think through a day uh, without referring to this chapter in, in one way or another. So Romans 8, verses 28 through 30. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And these who he has predestined, he also called, and these who he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. So what I want us to see here is I want us to see the purposes of God here. Okay, this isn't a last minute accidental thing that's taking place. This was God's plan before the foundation of the world. The names were written in the roll call before the creation of the world. And then we have the apostle writing by the spirit here telling us that those that God foreknew, he called. Those that he called, he justified. Those that he justified, he glorified. It's a continuous chain. If the first one is true of us, the last one will be true of us. And there's no chance for the chain to be broken in the middle. Uh, if the first is true of us, the last will be true of us. And the apostle actually speaks of it in the last tense here, in the past tense, like it's already occurred. Why? Because in the mind of God, it's as good as done. And there is nothing that is going to stand in the way of it being accomplished. Hallelujah. These are words of comfort. Uh, a scripture that I also referred to not long ago, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, this text makes it explicit that even the faith that saves us is the gift of God. So when I make it to heaven someday, I don't get up there and go, yes, I did it, right? There's none of that. Why? Because as it says here, it's a gift. If you're going to brag about a gift, then you brag about the one who gave it to you. And that's exactly what is true uh, from this text here. Uh, there's nothing for us to brag about except the Lord Jesus and God himself for providing us with this exquisite gift of faith and of salvation. Um, we come with empty, empty hands and God bestows this upon us simply because he shows us his undeserving favor. Um, it's not something that we do of ourselves. Now, let me also state because I think this is important, that in no way diminishes our responsibility. <laughs> Scripture makes it plain. We are responsible and we will be judged if we refuse to put our faith in Jesus. These two things, they exist in Scripture side by side. We have divine sovereignty and we have human responsibility. And uh, if you're going to ask me how everything works in between them, I will tell you I have no idea. I just know that Scripture is very clear about both. And so here we have it. <clears throat> Doesn't diminish our responsibility, yet we are being held in the power of God. First Peter 1, 3 and, and following, and I want us to keep in mind here, Peter is writing to a group of believers that is being horribly persecuted for their faith, okay? And so right out of the gate, this is what the Apostle Peter has to say to them. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, 
you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which perishes, though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that's a pretty big section here, but it's exactly fitting to what we're talking about here. Okay? So, first of all, our inheritance is imperishable. It's never going to fade away. It's never going to become less valuable than it started. It's never going to disappear. Uh, the inheritance that we have obtained in Christ is always going to be awesome, and it is always going to be there for us. Mm -hmm. It's not going anywhere. It's not temporary. Unlike anything that this world has to offer. Okay? So I want us to, to keep that in mind. Also, we are being protected by the power of God through faith. So right there, it makes it plain that what is being protected is our position in Christ through our faith. Meaning, that God is holding us securely in our faith in Jesus Christ. And so if our faith in Jesus is secure, so is the inheritance that comes through that faith. And this is important for us to understand too, just like if we go back to Romans 8, what we just talked about. Uh, in 8.28, it says that God is working all things for the good of those that love God, for those that are called according to his purpose. So, this is important, and I, I preach on this all the time, I know, because I know how important this is for us to keep in mind. Um, it is the idea here that <clears throat> whatever happens to us, even if we don't fully understand it, we can trust in the fact that God is somehow using it for our ultimate good. Whether it is our betterment, whether it is helping us to grow in our faith, God has a purpose in it. It is not meaningless, um, and he is certainly not being cruel, okay? That much I can attest to you from the words of Scripture. <laughs> well, here in 1 Peter, it is telling us that often when we go through these trials and tribulations, uh, it serves as a test for our faith. And when that faith gets tested, then we start to think, wow, God saw me through this. I got through this, and then something else will happen. And then as we go through these trials, we become more and more secure in our faith. And as the text says, that is more va valuable than gold or silver or anything. And just like gold gets tested by being passed through the fire, which burns away all the impurities, God does the same thing with a believer. And uh, none of this is meaningless. It serves the purpose of demonstrating that we are true believers in Christ. In John 10, verses 27 and 29, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Father, uh, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So this is one of my favorite verses in this regard because it gives me a bit of a picture and I've, I've used this scripture many, many times. See you folks, bless. <clears throat> but what we have here is Jesus is saying, I'm holding on to the believer and nobody can snatch them out of my hand. And he's also saying, and my father who is greater of all is also holding on to them and nobody can snatch them out of his hand. And so we see like a double handhold here, father and son, holding the believer. And if that doesn't paint a picture of security for us, then I don't know what does. Uh, good, good stuff. Now, we definitely can come across uh, some passages in Scripture that can kind of make it sound like, wait a second, maybe a believer can lose their faith. And actually, just a few weeks ago, Doug and I had a whole conversation about a passage in Hebrews. But here's what I want us to keep in mind. Uh, God doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth, right? Uh, he's not going to say it's one way and then it's another way. And also, the Holy Spirit, who is also God, who inspired these words, 
is not going to contradict himself. Mm -hmm. So we always have to keep in mind that the greatest interpreter of scripture is other scripture. So if we have all of these clear-cut passages that teach that we can't lose our salvation, and then we come to a passage that seems to teach that, wait a second, maybe we can, then we need to make sure that our final understanding rests in the most restrictive scripture, which to me is very, very clear that that means that a believer cannot uh, lose their salvation. But we also need to remember, and I think that's the function of a lot of these scriptures, we don't want to be flippant. We don't want to be cavalier. We don't want to be casual about the state of our faith. Uh, because as I said, we are still held responsible. And so uh, I think that's how we are to understand uh, any passages that might seem to say something different. <clears throat> Scripture does tell us that if anyone does ultimately fall away and abandon their faith, then it was because they were never really a believer in the first place. 1 John 2, 18 and 19 says, Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be evident that they are not all of us. And so that makes it very clear and actually fits beautifully with the passage that we're in here in the context of the coming of Antichrist and the Antichrist that have existed all through the history of the church. That ultimately there are some that fall away. But if they do, it was because they never had genuine faith in Christ in the first place. So looking at verse 13... And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Mm. So it may seem a little strange to us still uh, to talk about the fact that death could be a blessing. Um, that's a hard thing to think about sometimes. But really, if we really think about all that we know to be true, if we know what scripture has to say about what awaits the believer after this, uh, then to some regard, we should be happy about when that opportunity comes for us to move on to the next world. Because if you believe what the scriptures say, it is going to be so glorious and so much better than being here. Um, in fact, the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So the apostle saw the fact that it was so much better to be at home with the Lord. And yet he always felt that tension of, but he has work for me to do here. Uh, and we all have work to do while we're here, as long as the Lord sees fit to keep us here. And then in God's timing, um, when we leave here, we go to be in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> What is meant here by being in the Lord is, of course, is being united to Jesus in faith, uh, in believing in him, in trusting in him. And scripture actually states that he comes to be in us and we are also in him. Uh, and scripture often talks about the relationship uh, of the Godhead in that same way. Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And this is a tremendous picture of the closeness of that relationship. And the, the same terminology is also used of the believer. And ultimately, that's what it means to be in Christ, is to have a close, personal relationship with him. And so that's what the scripture means when it says that we are in him. We are trusting in him, we have faith in him, and we are united to him. <clears throat> when we are in Christ and we are united with him, the concept of blessing becomes very different in regards to how we see blessing versus how the world often sees the concept of blessing. In fact, this is demonstrated if we simply look at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, 
for they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who, are, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on to say, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So again, context is everything, right? If the context here and the persecution and the suffering and the difficulty comes simply because we are in Jesus and we're following him and trying to do what Jesus tells us to do, then the very persecution, persecution and the suffering actually becomes a blessing. And I always marvel at this scripture every time I read it. But in the book of Acts, in the opening chapters, we watch the apostles go from scared guys that were scattered when Jesus went to the cross to in the Holy Spirit becoming bold preachers of the gospel, who we read in Acts 5, verse 41. They rejoiced that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name. And they were beaten severely for preaching the gospel. Yet they simply considered themselves uh, blessed to be counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Now, Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 12, not to be conformed to this world, but to be renewed, uh, <clears throat> but to be uh, renewed by the renewing of our mind, to have a different way of viewing things. Well, this just turns everything on its ear because the world just looks at these things and says, these people are crazy. Um, but it also speaks volumes when people are willing to suffer for the name of Jesus. Uh, this is nothing short of a radical realignment of priorities. Uh, we are also told that the works or the deeds of those who die in the Lord, their works and their deeds will follow them. So everything that we do uh, in the name of God, for God and for his kingdom priorities, is eternal. It will last forever. It is always of importance. Um, the things that we do for ourselves, on the other hand, or when we, uh, Scripture is pretty plain about this, when we try to do something else for, for our own glory or to attract attention to ourselves, um, the Scripture says we've already received our reward. That's all the reward that we'll get. Uh, but when we are genuinely serving God, there are heavenly rewards that come to those uh, who are uh, trying to serve God and prioritizing the kingdom priorities. Uh, and those things will always carry weight. Um, they will always be important, and the results of those works will last forever. <clears throat> Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name by having served and by still serving the saints. Uh, in fact, um, Jesus says that even if we so much as give another believer a glass of cold water, uh, that there is a reward associated with that. Um, it can be funny to think about things in terms of rewards uh, or doing things because of rewards, but that's actually one of the key motivations that Scripture gives us to maintain our faith and to maintain our faith in Jesus. And uh, I often think about uh, Hebrews chapter 12, because um, this is a beautiful picture, I think. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and of the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So I just love this picture of the Christian life as a race. 
probably because I used to be an endurance athlete, and it really speaks volumes to me of what's required. Uh, I never started a race where I came to the start line and the word no was anywhere in my vocabulary. Because when I knew when it started to hurt and when it started to get difficult, if the word no was there, I was going to find it. Um, this is the calling for every believer is that we count the cost. We want to start well. We want to understand that the, the Christian life can be costly. It can be difficult. But we want to see it through. Um, and we will see it through if we simply keep coming back to the cross. Uh, we need to have these verses. One of the reasons why I think it's important for us to hear these over and over again. Uh, when the adversary is trying to mop the floor with us, we need to know where to go to find comfort. And we need to know that we're not just being held in our own strength, in our own effort, but we are being held by the power of God and we are looking forward to an eternal rest. The scripture here says that there's no rest for the wicked day or night. Their torment goes on and on. But for the believer, we look forward to after the toils of this life, looking forward to a true heavenly rest. But we have to keep these things in mind. And it's scriptures like these that will uh, bolster us uh, as we face that kind of difficulty. So with that, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for these words of encouragement. Um, we ask you, Father, just give us the strength uh, when we're feeling beat up, when our walk looks more like a crawl, um, when it looks like we're losing our way, just keep bringing us back to the foot of the cross. Uh, keep having us to throw ourselves on the mercy that's available in Jesus and just help us to hold our faith. Uh, no matter what's going on here, we need to keep looking ahead. Uh, this is a path that the Lord has already paved for us. Uh, his path was the same. It was humility and suffering followed by glory. And if we simply cling to faith in his name, uh, we will walk that same path. And we will reach the finish line where Jesus is holding out his arms awaiting us. Uh, Father, also help us to use this motivation to reach out. Uh, with a fallen world uh, with this gospel message uh, so that we can bring as many brothers and sisters as you would call into the kingdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, this has been on my mind all through the service, even before. As, it, as churches, we need to start praying for revival in this country. Yes. Yeah. And that we are able to stand up for what's right for Christ. And I think if the churches start praying for revival mm -hmm. in every service that the Lord will intervene and, and change things in this world. I think you're absolutely right, Rick. And uh, <clears throat> why don't we purpose to do that? Uh, that there's nothing more important than that um, to, to bringing other people into the kingdom it's what we're supposed to be all about and uh, Lord knows we need revival yes, do. yes thank you very much for sharing that and I thank you all for your patience uh, the clock uh, runs fast around here <laughs> so thank you very much and I hope you all have a blessed Sunday